William Flow is a yeah. contest. Okay, one more. Welcome to the Massage Hodge podcast. My name is Nick Paterka, licensed massage therapist here in Portland, Oregon. And I am here with Dr. William Flo, a chiropractor in the greater, serving the greater Portland area. And I think the, the smartest, easiest way to say, oh, hello. Hey, Nick. Good to see <laughs> it's, you. Uh, yeah, good to see you too. We've known each other for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a few years. I have been your patient on and off. And my kids have been patients of your yes, wife. Yes, my, my, former, my former spouse, yeah, as former it were. Spouse, yeah, yeah they, they still have a good time there. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they do. It's awesome yeah. there. Yeah, so um, way back. Yeah, yeah, it's good. And so I think uh, a good way to start is to talk about your your path towards where you are now. I know that you had time as a massage therapist like myself for years. Yes. And then that led you to, to where you are now. Yeah. yeah. So if you yeah. could talk about that path. Well, gosh, you know, it started when I was a, a teenager. I was involved in martial arts. I did Taekwondo, and that was one of my passions and uh, after you know, I went to college to study music, which was one of my other passions. This was in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, when I came back, I kind of circled around about seven years later and rediscovered my passion for the martial arts. And then I developed an interest as a massage client from the sports massage perspective because I, I knew that receiving massage would help me uh, kind of do a better job as a martial artist. And... Uh, well, then I got brave and I moved off to the city. Uh, this was in Denver, and I uh, kind of opened my own small martial arts studio, and I had a small group of students I was training in. And uh, one of the, well, I was approached by this woman who was a massage therapist, and she wanted to barter services. She wanted me to teach her kids Taekwondo. And it was through her that I learned about this uh, method of energy healing called Reiki. And um, I was pretty skeptical at first and then she started teaching me the Reiki the practice of the energy work and giving me the attunements and uh, I was kind of like okay whatever you know um, and then uh, one day I hurt my ankle really bad I had I had registered to go compete in a Taekwondo tournament and I was really excited and two weeks before the tournament I was uh, leaping down a flight of stairs exuberantly and I landed wrong and hurt my ankle <laughs> really bad and it so was the like, injury had nothing to do with Taekwondo no <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than it was after class one day but I, I was uh, you know I couldn't even put weight on it and I was like what am I gonna do I was supposed to go work uh, I was working um, delivering pizzas at the time and I was like I gotta work a full day delivering pizzas around Denver and how am I gonna do that I can't even walk. I can't even put any weight on this ankle. I didn't know what to do. So I, I managed to get home. I was literally hopping on one foot uh, out to the car and then hopping into the house. And I like plopped down and I was like, I didn't know what to do. And I was like, well, maybe I should try this Reiki thing. So I put my hand over the injury site on my ankle and I started concentrating on the Reiki symbols and, and focusing the energy. And lo and behold, the pain, that deep, intense, constant aching pain of a brand new injury, it just went away. And I was like, whoa, that's, awesome. that's pretty interesting. And I pulled my hand away. And after about four or five seconds, the pain came screaming back. Mm. And I put my hand back and I started doing the energy again. And the pain went away. And I was like, whoa, that was really, really interesting. So I sat there for like two hours just doing energy work with my ankle hmm. until it was basically not hurting anymore. The swelling was down. I went to bed, got up the next morning. I was able to gingerly put weight on my foot. I got through my whole work day. Uh, delivering wow. pizzas without re-injuring my ankle, walking fairly normally on it, and I continued to do the energy work, the Reiki, on my ankle for a couple more days. Two weeks later, I went and competed in this Taekwondo tournament and wow. pain-free. And that and was, was your your experience with the body work affecting your performance in martial arts? Was it all Reiki or was it other? No, I, I had been receiving deep tissue oh, okay. forms of massage yeah. as well. Yeah, and and experiencing the benefits of that definitely, but that was really that that whole experience with the ankle injury and and uh, you know experiencing firsthand the reality of this energy work that I was so skeptical about. It just that experience just kind of swept away my skepticism and something woke up inside me and said, "You you need to be a healer. You've been hearing this message for years." 
and now it's time to act on it. Wow. So that's what got me to enroll in massage school. Mm-hmm. And uh, I came out of massage school um, all gung, gung-ho, and I, I practiced uh, in a number of different settings. I practiced uh, in a spa. I practiced in a, in a health club. I practiced in a, a massage, like a, a therapeutic uh, medical massage clinic. I had private practice. Practice at chiropractic office, a couple of different chiropractic offices. So I practiced in a lot of different settings over the next 10 years. About um, over, Never for yourself, though. Yeah, for myself. Oh, you did uh, have private practice. Yes, yeah, I did yeah. do private practice as well. Um, I, about four years into my massage career, I was back at the school, Colorado School of Music and Arts, where I got my training, um, buying lotion in the bookstore. And uh, one of the administrators kind of was like, hey, hey, good to see you. Pulled me aside and was like, do you want to teach? And I was like, um... Okay, <laughs> so that's what got me started teaching, and I fell in love with teaching. That's the, uh, that's the interview process. Of yeah, right, 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 yeah. But it, no, but it was awesome. Because that school is still there today? Oh, yeah, oh, cool. and they're very, very successful. Yeah. Yeah, they, um, they've been there a long time, and they're very successful. And, um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of what got me started teaching, and uh, so, you know, that was in 2000. I got my massage license, my massage, I finished my massage training in Colorado in 97. And then I started teaching in 2000. And then in 2005, 2006, moved out to Oregon, went to chiropractic college. And I, I wrapped up my chiropractic training at the end of 2009, and I've been licensed and practicing since 2010. Wow. And that's my path. And then, so um, I, you know, I, I really enjoy the manual manipulation part of mm-hmm. chiropractic. You know, Turning and cracking things is is always fun. People no, love makes that. Makes me want to do that. But, yeah, I'd sit here. But uh, one of the things that uh, I I really liked as a massage therapist, one of the modalities that really spoke to me was, uh, you know, I guess one of the general terms for it is manual therapy, cranial therapy, or visceral therapy. I had taken a number of ser- seminars from people like uh, Frank Lowen and Sharon Weiselfish Giamatteo and had started to fall in love with that really subtle light touch way of approaching mm-hmm. the internal organs and the blood vessels and the other mm-hmm. soft squishy things that you don't you don't really affect with more of your <clears throat> mainstream massage or chiropractic mm-hmm. modalities um so it was in uh, i think it was in november of 2018 that i finally took my first seminar from the Baral Institute. Okay. Um, and Jean-Pierre Baral is a uh, osteopath from France who brought his work, visceral manipulation, to the United States in the mid 80s. And I knew who he was back in the late 90s when I was first studying uh, visceral and cranial therapy. I knew who Baral was, I'd heard about him. Um, I had taken courses from people who were his protégés. And um, so I finally took my first Baral seminar in, in late 2018, and that was another big eye-opener for mm. me. It was kind of similar to the experience I had with the ankle injury, and it was just like clouds parting, lights shining down on me, oh, wow. and I was like, this is the work I need to do. This is what I've been looking for for 23 years. Wow. So um, when I had that experience, um, I kind of changed my career trajectory. Hmm. I quit the job I had been in for six years. Which was more traditional chiropractic yeah. environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a great job. It was a great practice. And I, I, I have nothing but respect and gratitude for the people yeah. that I worked with. Um, and, um, and I, you know, it is a great, a great uh, chiropractic, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, practice model. Yeah. A really complete practice model with functional rehab and functional uh, medicine. And, mm. um, but in terms of the, the hands-on piece, putting the hands on the body, um, I had a refocusing um, that I think I was really ready for. So mm-hmm. that's when I kind of stepped out on my own and uh, opened this clinic here. Yeah. And that's how I've been practicing ever since. And I'm doing so, visceral manipulation and, and uh, cranial neuromeningeal manipulation. Ooh, that's a, that's a mouthful. So, <laughs> Good stuff. so if we take the, what, what, I mean, I'm not a chiropractor, obviously, but uh, if we take the sort of standard model that I see, mm-hmm. which is, you go to your chiropractor, did they talk to you about what's going on? Maybe they send in a, an assistant or a, or a massage therapist for a few minutes and then the chiropractor comes back, adjusts you and maybe gives you some exercises or whatever mm-hmm. and, and sends you on your merry way. And you're maybe in that office for 30 minutes. Right. 
that's not what your practice looks like. It's a little bit different yeah. now. Um, I do spend about 30 minutes in most patient visits, or about 30 minutes. But it is just you and the patient it's the whole time. Just me and the patient. Yeah. 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 And I do occasionally, I'll recommend um, some therapeutic exercises and yeah. things like that. Yeah. But that's not but the, I mean, the, of the practice. The, I guess, how would you distinguish what's happening on the table from what what the general public might That's think of question. as yeah. chiropractic. That's work. a great question. So um, to really explain that well, I think we need to, to look at chiropractic and, and what it is at its core. And I think one, the thing that most chiropractors will agree is that chiropractic works through the nervous system. When a chiropractor adjusts a joint, they put a mechanical stimulus into the fibers of the joint capsule. And, sorry. They put mechanical stimulus into the fibers of that joint capsule and it sends a barrage of sensory information to the brain. And the brain says, oh, that's how that brain, that, that's how that joint is supposed to be operating. And so then the brain can change the motor responses coming out, right? It can change the control of the muscles. It can change the control of the, cir the circulatory structures around that joint. So it's all about providing mechanical stimulus to the body that the brain then uses to correct the function. Massage is the same way. You're stimulating the sensory receptors in the muscles and in the tendons mm -hmm. to create a therapeutic response at the level of the brain. And what I do is the same. It's stimulating sensory receptors in the tissues. What I do that's differently, what's different than, I guess, your more mainstream chiropractic approaches is that it's not high velocity. It's not a quick thrust. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's it's very light, and very subtle pressure mm -hmm. most of the time. Um, it's a lot slower. Mm -hmm. So I get a hold of a restricted tissue, and I'll put very, very subtle tension into it, and I'll engage it just at the right amount to stimulate a response. And then I'll hang on to it, and I'll follow and follow and follow that response. It's like an unwinding kind of mm -hmm. motion that I follow until it settles down and you get a feeling of like the whole area just kind of relax and you're letting go. What is it? So it's, it's so interesting it's, to me. And I've heard more subtle. this like kind it's of craniosacral general. approach where it's all yeah. about like developing that feel. Mm -hmm. What does it take to, like I'm interested in it. I'm just curious. I guess I just need to take a class and, and see what it's, I've taken like intro, like when I was in school yeah. to. Intro to cranial. Yeah. yeah. What did you think? I felt like there's really something there. You could yeah. feel that rhythm. Yeah. 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 You should take a class. Definitely. Yeah. It is, it is a subtle sensation and you have to kind of open your mind and allow your, you have to put your skepticism on hold for just yeah. a moment. Cause I remember when I first that. tried it, I was like, is that the rhythm? Is that it? Right. Can I feel it? I'm not feeling it. I'm not, I'm right. terrible at this. That was, the same like, skepticism. that was the same yeah. skepticism that I encountered when I was first learning Reiki. Yeah. And then right. this, the constant dialogue in my head being like, right. Not, you know yeah, what I like? It. I like it's it's so easy for a person to dismiss it mm -hmm. because they don't have the patience to really listen with their hands mm -hmm. and feel it. <clears throat> yeah. So they can say, "Well, that, you're making that up. There's nothing there." You right. how can you feel that? You can't feel that. Right. Right. I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a couple analogies that I think are great. And the first analogy is like an orchestra conductor, right? If you or I go to the symphony, and we listen to a, a presentation of uh, you know. Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto in E minor, right? And we hear this beautiful music and we have this experience of it and uh, it's not the same experience that the orchestra conductor is having, right? Mm. The orchestra conductor hears every detail. Mm -hmm. He knows which flute player is in tune and which one's out of tune. He knows if that timpani was right on the beat or a little bit behind the beat. Mm -hmm. He knows every detail of every part because he has trained his hearing or more specifically, he's trained his brain. He's trained his sensory cortex to the point to where he can recognize that level of detail. Mm. You or I don't recognize that level right. of detail. We just hear, oh, that's beautiful music. It sounds right. great. That was a violin. That was a trumpet. Yeah. Right? We've got that <laughs> or level maybe of not even, yeah. right? Um, another analogy that I think is great is like my brother. My brother has had a long career as a chef and a food and beverage manager and a sommelier. Okay. Oh, and wow. He has trained his palate or more specifically, he's trained his sensory cortex in his brain to mm -hmm. recognize very, very subtle discriminations in flavor. Oh, wow. Right? He can taste the wine and tell you what region of France and probably which vineyard in which year. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. Right? 
So, so that's what I've done with my hands. Yeah. Which is what the sommelier does with their palate, what the conductor does with their ear. Yeah. So and if, if you take someone like me, for example, who's very mm -hmm. like limited intro, and I take a class, I can start using what I've learned. Obviously, I'm not going to feel what you're feeling in the same way, but I could still be helping people Absolutely. with that skill yes. right what, away. That's what you do. Yeah. You take craniosacral level one, mm -hmm. and you you get what you can. Yeah. Right? There's so much information in those classes. There's no way you're going to retain it all. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so you take the class and you start practicing whatever you remember. You go back to your books and you mm -hmm. try to you try you do your best you can. And I think to put it into practice. Maybe worth mentioning that to be to be responsible, you wouldn't take the intro class and then say you're a craniosacral therapist. I think it's a little bit of a yeah danger you know, there. <laughs> well, you don't want to misrepresent yourself, right? But you. Um, but if you're practicing cranial work, you're practicing cranial work, mm -hmm. right? That's sort of the hodgepodge thing. Yeah. For me, it's like I would take that class, and then I'd be like, "Oh, now I can pull that." That's another right. tool that. I and a lot of a lot of therapists, I think, do that. Is yeah. they don't necessarily. I mean, because a certification in a certain modality, like neuromuscular therapy or myofascial release or craniosacral therapy, a certification and modality doesn't change your scope of practice. Right. It doesn't change any of the rules or regulations around how you market yourself. Mm -hmm. And people can have, you know, one class in a certain modality and say, I practice this modality. Hmm. They do. Yeah. You know, um, but uh, yeah, no, but I think, you know, in terms of the more subtle approaches, like the visceral manipulation, the craniosacral, I think it's just, you know, if you're interested, you start by taking a class and then you start trying to put it into practice as much as you can. Yeah. You get together with people you meet in the class and practice it outside. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah, I got to the, the pleasure of taking a shiatsu mm -hmm. one at Oregon School of Massage, where you still teach sometimes. Yeah, usually I teach about one course every term or so. Oh, okay. Yeah. What's coming up for you there? Neuromuscular therapy oh, wow. is coming up in February. I don't remember the date, um, but yeah, it's, I think it's a hip and, hip, thigh, and knee class. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I was there taking shiatsu with Wendy Ward. Mm -hmm. I love Wendy. Oh, she's great. She's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I got, got to pull some skills. I'm not going to call myself a shiatsu therapist. I, do, I think I, I would take shiatsu too at some point. I don't know that I would go down the whole rabbit hole. And um, There's a lot there. There's yeah. a lot of great skills to pull from that too. That's yeah. cool. And I, I have not, I've not um, tossed the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. I still use a lot of the manipulation skills yeah. that I developed in chiropractic school and in, in uh, you know, nine years of practicing yeah. in the field. Um, you know, just this morning, I did a classic crack crack on the upper neck uh -huh. of this gentleman because that's what he needed. Right. You yeah, know? it's about need and intention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because, uh, you know, I could have um, I could have sat there and worked with the cranial membranes, but I really felt that he needed something different. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So I don't always do just one modality with everybody. Yeah. Right. You mean, yeah, you bring to bear all the skills you have. Right. Yeah. Right. The value of that long term. Yeah. Um, that, that leads me to a good question that I'm trying to ask everyone who will eventually be on the show. Longevity. Mm -hmm. This industry has a lot of, I mean, massage therapy, maybe chiropractic, I don't you could speak to that, has a high burnout rate. And I just want to start logging opinions and ideas mm -hmm. about how to make practice last longer yeah. for yourself, yeah. energetically, physically. Like, yeah. what do you, and you can just speak Personally, like, what do you do for yourself, or what do you see yeah. working in terms of promoting longevity as a therapist? Boy, that is a great multi-layered question. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with chiropractic. So I think chiropractors tend to have longer careers, and one of the reasons for that is that it is a lot more of a financial and time commitment to get a chiropractic license. Mm. It's a doctorate, so uh -huh. you're looking at eight years of school. Right. And a lot, 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 lot more money than to get a massage therapy license. So, so there's that upfront investment. You're like, I yeah. can't and easily I've, walk away I've, from this. And I've heard stories of chiropractors who were in practice for you know five or six years and then went into real estate. Interesting. And, and I'm like, well, they they didn't choose the right profession. Right. Getting started. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, massage therapy definitely is. Both of those practices can be hard on your body. Mm -hmm. They both involve a lot of specific physical work. Um, I think as a massage therapist, 
it was harder on my hands than chiropractic mm -hmm. because I did a lot of really deep work. In addition to the light, the low force, mm -hmm. and the visceral and stuff, I did a lot of deep work too. Um, I think, you know, massage therapists, when they decide that they want to do this and they decide to go to massage school and to get that license, um, you need to have a realistic expectation. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we get sold a little bit of overblown expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, the schools want to get students in the door so they can pay their overhead, right? Right. So they want to make the career look really rosy. So, they, you know, you hear stories about, well, you can make $60 an hour. It's not the whole story. Yeah, that's sure. not the whole story. Yeah. I mean, because you've got all your overhead, right? Right. As a business owner, you can bill your clients. 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 dollars an hour, whatever you set mm -hmm. the price, right? But then you've got to pay your overhead and you have to build the clientele. So you need to be a business person. You need to be a marketer. Mm -hmm. You need to be all those things as well. Oh yeah. And I think that that it's 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 hard for some people. Like yeah. I never really did very well as a marketer. Like going yeah. out and selling myself is not my That's a, strong point. So And I think the schools, you know, despite their best efforts, it's not a, you know, a big part. I don't know what OSM does, but I know at East West College there was a business class. Yeah. But I mean, they kind of had to teach it to everybody, and and I don't fault yeah. them for that. It was kind of it is what it is. They gave you a good intro. I mean, it was something yeah. to start with. I think you know if you if you want to be a chiropractor, I think it's worth your time to get the MBA. Mm -hmm. You know, before, oh, wow. or during, or after your doctorate, because if you want to make a really good living and put some money in the bank. And invest in the stock market and all that, you really know how to run need to know how to run a business. Interesting. You know, that's yeah. you know, the chiropractors who do do well are I don't know, I hope I don't sound too cynical. They're business people first mm -hmm. and healers second. Well that's how I would describe my former spouse who owns World of Smiles. I'd say she's a business person first and then a dentist. Yeah. She's a great dentist, but her business skills are off the charts. Yeah. 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 So um yeah. You know, but, you know, looping back around to some of the other things you brought up, like self-care is really, really yeah. important. Well, that was, yeah, that was how longevity, I feel like, dovetails right into self-care, which yeah. is one of my next questions. Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the, you know, there's, there's the basics of don't overwork your hands, right? Like, so if you're going to work for a spa or something like that, where you're stepping into a job where you've already got clients on your table, and you just right. need to show up. Like a corporate environment where they, yeah. might, they might be like, oh, you want to do seven in a day? Here you go. Right. Yeah. You need to be careful. You yeah. need to be careful because a lot of time clients are going to come to you and they're going to want really deep work and you're yeah. going to hurt yourself trying, mm -hmm. trying to make them happy. Um, so be careful about that. Don't push your hands harder mm -hmm. than your hands want to be pushed mm -hmm. because that will end your career before you want it to end. Right. Um, for sure. So that's that's the first thing is is um, you know work at a level of depth and in terms of number of clients per day or per week that is going to work for your body. And that's including that's acknowledging the idea that you're already using proper body. I mean, there's a, there's right. no amount of like perfect body mechanics that's going to save your hands from ten yeah. hours of massage a day. Right. Right, like I'm, I'm asking, yeah. like that's ten, like ten hours of massage like, a day is going to wreck your hand. Body mechanics, you know, even if they're pristine, yeah, they're only going to get you so far. Right. Okay. Right. You still have, you know, the reality of, of physical yeah. tissue yeah. Over, overload. Yeah, I've that, been thinking you know. about it personally. Like I was like, I'm gonna, like I have a hand exerciser now. Mm -hmm. I'm like, there's a point where, like in the massage therapy field, we talk a lot about perfecting those body mechanics, mm -hmm. but I'm like there's a certain point where you just got to be stronger. Like it's only going to help you to be strong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think building good habits from the start is really important. So when you're like, Oh, I need to work on my body mechanics. Then the only answer to that is work on your body mechanics. Every moment, every breath of every massage yeah. you do be constantly correcting yourself mm -hmm. constantly. Like, the, Oh, I'll fix my body mechanics after I get this trap to let go. No, stop, drop your shoulders, drop into your hips, take mm -hmm. a breath. And work on the trap from better body mechanics. Mm -hmm. You just have to make that a mantra. It's like a, it's, 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 you know, it's like a practice. You know, yeah. you just need to make it part of. It's a, a mindfulness mm. meditation. Yeah. Right. Paying attention to what you're doing. Paying attention to your own body mechanics. Paying attention to the tissue you're touching. Yeah. You find yourself thinking about something else. Oh, the cat, the dog, 
the car. Then you're not there with the client. Right. Then yeah. you need to take a breath, say, okay, I'm thinking, let go of that thought and pay attention to what's right in front of me. Pay yeah. attention to my body, pay attention to the client's body. Yeah. It becomes yeah. a meditation. I've never really thought about body work as a meditation practice, absolutely. but it makes total sense. It's, yeah, body work is a meditation practice for me. In my work is. Yeah, no, I, it's you know, Yeah, whenever I'm with a client or a patient, I am 100% focused on them. And when I find my mind wandering, it doesn't wander for very long because yeah. I've made that habit of catching it and refocusing. Um, and I bet that that practice informs the rest of your life. I couldn't do the visceral work if I didn't have that level of... Right paying attention to the moment because it's too subtle. Mm -hmm. It's too subtle. If I'm distracted, I'm going to miss it. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, it does. It becomes, you know, if I spend, you know, however many hours a day in this sort of mindfulness movement practice with these other people, um, it just brings a level of calm and peace yeah. in my whole psyche that translates into the relationships with my family members and everything in my life. That's great. And, uh, you know, I, um, yeah, I'm very happy doing the work that I do. And but in in terms of self care, like that's a big piece of it. It's yeah. you have to make your practice a meditation. You have to make mm. it about you and about the clients, and not about all the other stuff that makes you worry. Mm -hmm. It needs to be your practice as a body worker should be an escape from your stressors in life. Mm. You know? Yeah. I mean, you've got the paperwork and the charting and the financial, and you've got to run the business and all that, and that can be very stressful. Yeah. When you're with the clients, just be present and be with the client yeah don't worry about anything else hmm. don't worry all that other stuff that you worry about will still still be there yeah for about. sure It'll yeah <laughs> right but for this moment until 3 p.m or whatever yeah you're just focusing on your on your clot yourself your own body the client's body yeah right what um, do you and in terms of self-care what do you do for yourself if you would speak to that person well i do a lot of meditation Okay. Yeah. Beyond but, your body, beyond right, the table. Right. So I like, uh, um, I, I don't do it every day. I try to do it every day, but I don't. But I sit down on a meditation cushion in front of the fireplace yeah. at home, or I sit down on a meditation cushion in a meditation room here in the, in the clinic. Yeah. And I close my eyes and I breathe and I just practice great uh, gratitude and right. I just practice breath and mm. presence and I catch my mind wandering and I, I'm like, okay, thank you. And I come back to the breath. So I, I have a, like a mindfulness meditation practice that's yeah. really important. Um, I get body work myself. Oh, sure. So I have other people work on me. Um, and lots of different modalities. It's not all just visceral manipulation. Mm. Um, although that's that's a really important piece because that's, that's the way that I practice. Um, I've heard, you know, long ago when I was first starting on this pathway in the mid-90s, I heard this idea that you... You can't lead a person to a place where you've never been, hmm. right? So if you have a lot of tension and restriction in, say, your liver, for example, you can't really correct somebody else's dysfunctional liver if your own is super out of whack. Hmm. So that's another concept is, you know, if, if, if I want to be able to refine the mechanical functioning of my patient's body, I need to be constantly working on my own. Yeah. Constantly having other people put their hands on me, find where I'm stuck. Yeah. And free that up. So my body becomes you know, more and more efficient. I mean, yeah. you, you know, we're all aging. I'm, I just turned 51. Um, so I, I, this is the oldest I've ever been. In December? Yeah. When's your birthday? 16. <laughs> I'm 29. Yeah. I just turned I know. 41. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, no, but I mean... It, it, so, I, I mean, I like to say, uh, this is the oldest I've ever been, right? <laughs> and, and, and I'm not getting any younger. And, um, you know, and I realize that, you know, we, we're all here for a limited time, right? And nobody, nobody here gets out alive, as Jim Morrison said. But <laughs> you can do this thing that in functional medicine, they call it squaring the life curve, right? If you have a x-axis and a y-axis, and your x-axis is your years, and the y-axis is your quality of life, most of us tend to gradually start to slip down. You get older, our quality yeah. of life gradually starts to get worse and worse and worse. Yeah. You can do things by eating a healthy diet and living a healthy lifestyle and getting work done on your body so that mechanically your body continues to work as efficiently as mm -hmm. possible. Yeah. You can square that life curve so your quality of life stays high right up to the end. Yeah. I like that idea. I feel like the way I've taken care of myself over the years, I may, I may actually be able to 
get it to go up a little bit <laughs> from where awesome. I am now. Yeah. Especially I'm that too. if I'm if I'm being honest, my self care of late has been basically non existent. Yeah. Haven't uh, on my birthday I did finally go get a massage, but uh, yeah, you've yeah, been eating poorly and not sleeping well, and <laughs> just uh, well, the holidays tend to do that. Yeah, to us. and the stress of being around family members. Yeah. and um, I had my I had you know, my finalized a divorce at the end of the year, yeah. so it's like a whole life change. Yeah. You've and been through a lot. You've been through a lot. But uh, so. it's if it's not too cliche, twenty twenty has been is is becoming a good reset. You know, new, yeah. new year, new decade. I think. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. You know, and. Uh, Work with that, right? Stay yeah. with that. Let it be. Um, let it be every moment. Yeah, it's a reset. Right. Mm. Let it be every breath that is a reset. Mm. And I did start a meditation practice. Good. Yeah. With an app. And forgive yourself. Oh. Every moment. <laughs> every breath. Yeah. Forgive yourself. Yeah. Because you can't change the past, but you can change the now. You can change the future by changing the now. So yeah. Hope not. Yeah, so that's a big part <laughs> of uh, longevity in the career is and self care. Uh, all that's all self-care. amazing stuff. You've got to take care of your body. You've got to make sure that mechanically, structurally, your body is working as efficiently as possible. Yeah, and you've got to take care of your psyche. Mm-hmm. You've, got to, you've got to make sure that whatever the things are that are gnawing on you, whatever the older resentments that go back to when you were a child or whatever those things are, that you're investigating them honestly. And, and coming to a place of forgiveness hmm. and acceptance, self-acceptance. Yeah. Only then can you really hold a safe and sacred place for a client to come and have a healing experience. Wow. I'm so glad I asked you about longevity. This is great. Yeah. This is good, good lessons it's here. It's the oldest yeah. I've ever been. <laughs> <laughs> um, wait, I made a note about it. Do you still do Taekwondo? Yeah. Yes. Regularly? Yeah? Yep. Competitively? Uh, no. No, I don't, I don't compete. I, I, I have... A, it's been a while since I've gone to a tournament and competed in forms, mm-hmm. um, but that's I'm not going to do sparring competition. Yeah. I don't want to get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am hoping to in in I think maybe April. I don't know if they've set the date yet, but hopefully hopefully this spring, I'm going to test for my third degree black belt. Wow. And my son, who's who's uh, ten and a half, will test for his first degree black belt. Oh, that's special. So we're looking forward to that. That's great. That's so, cool. And still, do you still play music? How did no, music fit into your life? Um, yeah, I um, music was one of my main passions when I was growing up. I played the tuba. And, uh, Tell me you still have a tuba. I don't have a tuba. Oh, no. um, I would love to hear that. I played the tuba, but I wanted to play a different instrument because oh. I, I learned, you know, this. I started on tuba in like fourth grade. And yeah. I learned pretty soon that uh, when tubas get, don't get very interesting parts, right? If you yeah, want to play the melody, don't you got to play range. a cornet or a yeah. flute or something if you want to play the the melody and so I wanted to switch instruments but my band director wouldn't allow that because he needed me on the tuba <laughs> so I, I find one of the only people who could physically carry the tuba no <laughs> no it was more that I, I I don't know I was I was I was a tuba player and that's what he needed mm. um so he finally retired and the next band director gave me an opportunity to switch different two different instruments and that's that was my senior year of high school and that's oh. when I started singing and I what I really wanted to be was a singer so oh, I wow. I went to college and studied music, but I never finished that degree. And, uh, you know, I was a self-taught uh, electric bass, yeah. bass guitar player and um, a little bit keyboards and would sing, lead singing with one lineup and backup vocals with another. And um, then worked collaboratively with friends yeah. uh, back in the 90s uh, writing music. Oh, cool. Um, which was fun, um, but I haven't, uh, I haven't played in a long yeah. time. My son is taking piano lessons now, and my yeah. bass guitar is sitting right there, yeah. right next to the amp, and I could pick it up and start playing it, but um, I just, I just haven't done yeah. that in a while. Yeah, I ask because music is a big part of my own self care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I pick up a guitar, or I sit yeah. in front of piano, or a um, drum set last year. Uh, drums the past couple of years lessons nice. have been really great for me. My youngest yeah. Santa brought my youngest uh, a drum set, a little yeah. electric drum set. Oh yeah, for Christmas. So that that was nice. No, it's sadly music is still a source of me beating up on myself. Oh, I still feel okay. like oh I, I should, but I don't. Okay. So I'm working. Well, here's the challenge then. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you caught it on my social or on YouTube. I randomly one day picked a uh, muscle from the trail guide flashcards okay. and I forced myself to write a song about it. 
Oh my. Unfortunately, I picked Glen, Ohio. <laughs> Am I saying that right? Oh, oh, Ohio. The, the, uh, under here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Ohio. Yeah. It, whatever it was, but I, uh, I had to write write a song about. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. Wow. I'm going to force you to write a song like me. Why? Well, right. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Or I will, uh, or I'll write it and make you do some uh, background vocals okay. and record it. It'll be fun. Sounds fun. Yeah. Sounds fun. Cool. Um, I, the, the only other question I had today, because it's top of mind for me right now while I'm trying to establish um, massage hodgepodge as a clinical practice, is any thoughts about practice building? I know you've you've built something for yourself at different times and different places. So any, any thoughts you've, and we've had conversations yeah. offline about this before, but this is, this is yeah. another, this is another topic. It's more of a source of me beating up on myself oh. because I, I feel like this is something that has always been my weak point is practice mm. building. And, um, uh, you know what it comes down to for me right now with this time in my life, it's, it's, it's about self-acceptance. Mm. It's about forgiving myself for perceived failures in the past and, and, and finding a place where I'm comfortable enough in my own skin that I can walk out the door, take my outreach literature, mm -hmm. and go talk to the neighborhood doctors and say, this is what I do and I want you to send me patients for this. Right. That's what I need to do. And um, I... Uh, it's hard to get out what, there. Yes, what yeah. has been stopping me? Mm. That's that's the meaningful question for me right now is mm -hmm. practice building is what has been stopping me and how do I move past it? Yeah. So uh, the last six months, I have been working hard on that. That's hence I've been doing all this meditation, mm -hmm. and working with therapists. I've been exploring like my deep past, looking at mm -hmm. old stuff that happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. And it's just that moment where you're like, I need to physically like walk into someone's office and you feel like yeah. And a lot of the stuff around that. So um, practice building, if, you know, some people it comes naturally. Some people seem to, like I had a really, really good friend in chiropractic school who was the founder and president of our business club. Mm. And he has built a very successful chiropractic practice. He's got like three clinics that he runs now. Uh -huh. And a bunch of employees. And uh, it, it's came natural to him. Like he is a business person. Who, yeah. Um, you know, he, he cares about people and he's got good hands as a chiropractor. So he's got the right pieces. Practice building came naturally for him and he did a really, really good job mm -hmm. right from the start. Yeah. Um, I've always struggled with that. And yeah. I, it's a lot of it is that, is that like belief in oneself, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I got to get my old baggage out of the way first. Yeah. And then, uh, having a, um, practice building strategy, like writing, writing down, what do you want to do? How are you going to get clients? What what kind of clients do you want? Yeah, that's been a big one for um, me about being more clear about what I do yeah. and who I can help. Right, and I think having some degree of specialization helps. Yeah, because you can build a niche, and if you have a niche, then you can go and advertise your niche, right? And people mm -hmm. are like, "Oh, who should I send you? You should send me these people." Instead of just saying everybody, everybody yeah. should come see me. Well, to that no... to that end, I I I remember speaking to you about how you really liked seeing clients with sort of intractable problems, like things mm -hmm. that they've spent, they've right. spent a lot of time working with other doctors and right. other, maybe even other chiropractors. That's, or, that's the niche that yeah. I'm trying to exploit is the, uh, the chronic pain. Chronic the person pain, who yeah. has failed other modalities. Yeah. Um, because that's where I feel that this modality that I'm practicing shines. Yeah. Because the person who's, They've got chronic pain, they've tried acupuncture, they've tried massage, they've tried chiropractic, they've tried PT, and nothing is helping. That, to me, is an indicator uh, that the body is trying to protect an underlying visceral uh, restriction. Yeah. So those are the people who I think would be uh, well-targeted for this approach. Cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, identifying what kind of clients you want on your table, what kind of work you want to do is the first step. The second step is laying out a strategy for getting yourself out there. And you're doing a fantastic job with your internet presence. Yeah, that's a, that, that's coming more easily to me. Yeah. The the brand of Massage Hodgepodge and making this podcast and putting videos and I'm gonna be doing long form um, massage therapy and, and other uh, modality um, sessions. It's the actual people through the door that's you know yeah. that's that's <laughs> yeah. what it comes down and that's to where that's, I, that's where i am right now yeah. yeah 
Yeah, but you're you're building an infrastructure, an electronic digital mm -hmm. infrastructure that is going to be far reaching. Yeah, it's going to grow. I so. and there's going to be tendrils reaching yeah. out through the social community. Mm -hmm. I want this to take me and on the, the road people, at some point too. I'm the people, go. yeah, the people who are the good fit for you will find you. Yeah, because of what you're doing now. Cool. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, you started to say. Well, no, I wanted it to road. take me in the uh, on the road. Like, I want to bring the like Thai massage from Thailand. Oh. And show that, show you what that's like. Show, show the world what that's like. And wow. yeah, Lomi Lomi in Hawaii. Like, yeah, wow. a friend of mine was like, "Oh, you want to be the the Anthony Bourdain of body work?" And I was like, "Yes, thank you. I would love that. <laughs> that sounds really cool." So this is a uh, part of that path, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that was a good conversation. I'm looking yes. at the clock now. So, but we we need to talk about how to find you. I want to say it's Dr. William Flo. What is my <laughs> Doctor, well, we'll William, link to it either way. Yeah, my my website is williamplodc.com. Oh, that's okay. W i l l i a m p l e a u d c dot com. Yes. Um, my phone number is 503-673-6500. Wow. All right. That's written. Put it right out there. <laughs> yeah. So that's how to reach me. My practice is yeah. in Beaverton. I'm right off of uh, you know the Cornell Bethany exit from Highway 26. Boom. I'm right yeah. there. In a building called the Life Qual Center, right next to the yeah. uh, Legacy. Amazing Medical building, Center. actually. That's yeah, a great building. building. A lot of wonderful practitioners. Yeah. Um, yeah. I should also say, if people who aren't in the area, they could also reach out to you with questions about anything sure. you've mentioned. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I'm happy to yeah. chat. And uh, LinkedIn's a good spot. Yeah, LinkedIn's maybe. good. Um, Facebook. Facebook is good. I do have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn presence. A you started bit. TikTok yet? No, I'm no. sorry. <laughs> I started um, TikTok. It's ridiculous. Well, somebody else was telling me about something else that I need that I can. Oh, you don't next, need to start next TikTok. door. I'll do a TikTok with you. Yeah, yeah, next door or something like that. Oh, that's local. Yeah, that's yeah. that's. I'm, I have to start that for myself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so right. many things. Yeah, it's always like. Yeah, but then there's the also like getting my physical body out the door. And yes. Into the medical clinics and uh, and uh, trying trying to get some face time with the local doctors. Yeah. So they can find out what I do, and uh, they can send me the patients who are not responding to conventional PT. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you. And That's I should say that you are going to be a recurring guest. Maybe not. Well, I, I mean, some, so. on the podcast, we'll probably speak again. I hope at so. At some point. I'm really excited about the uh, the, the muscle. Yeah, we're going to do. Do. We're going to talk about, uh, like, take a region type, maybe a shoulder or something. And talk yeah, about. we're going to do some videos about that. That'll be yeah. on YouTube and Facebook. Well, that'll be just be everywhere. We'll share yeah. those. We'll yeah. share those far and wide. Um, and that's largely about me re-educating myself because <laughs> I have access to you. So teach I love me, it. I love teach it. me and remind me about all the you things know, I need I, to know. I love it because uh, I I totally enjoy geeking out on the anatomy and the kinesiology and the pathology and the injuries and all that stuff. And uh, you know, it's another opportunity to get my face and my voice out there yeah, on the internet. Yeah, no doubt. That's what I need. So. All right. All right. So Everyone out there in the interwebs, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you.